while we're waiting for that to set up, let's check out these delightful uh, tap plastic um, molds that I made. If you'll recall, I was complaining about how I'd never been able to get good results with them. I do not recommend this stuff. Every time I've used it, I've been disappointed. And let's see if that continues to be the case. Okay, that looks good. I don't see any chunks of rubber in there. I can't tell if there's any bubbles. I don't see anything huge so far. So far, so good. Let's check out this one. Okay, I see a couple bubbles here on some of the peaks, but that's not unusual. Okay, it's been a couple days. Let's see how this mix turned out. Hmm. Um, it still feels a little bit greasy to me, which I'm very uncomfortable with. It is such a shame because, you know what, I'll do some painting tests and see how the paint sticks to it and if it rubs off or scratches off easily. We'll see how that goes. So here's a little trick I'm going to do. I'm trying to figure out how well this um, head aligns with the neck. I want it to be a nice snug fit so there's not a big seam. And so, because I can't see inside of it, when I, when I put it in, I can't quite see which parts are hitting, butting together. Um, but there's still some, some gaps here I'm trying to take care of. So. What I'm going to do is take some black paint and just smear it on the inside. And then in theory, wherever it touches the, the head part, there will be some black paint on the head. So I can see if I sand down those parts, um, I'll be able to get a, a more snug fit in theory. So you can see it's definitely hitting there and there. So I can either sand 
the uh, part down that's that's bumping against it on that side or on this side I imagine it's probably easier to do on here especially since there's a bunch of paint all over that now so I'm gonna sand this down a bit All right, time to cast some bits. So, here's a bit I want to cast. Um, casting means that I'm pouring resin into a mold and um, showed you how to make the mold. Uh, I'm gonna put some baby powder in here. You could use a number of release agents you don't actually need to use any for silicon molds like this, typically if you're using resin. Um, but it makes the mold last a little bit longer. Not a big concern, uh, since I'm only making a handful of casts out of these. However, uh, it does become important in that if you use baby powder like this, it actually um, can fill in some of the little cracks like really fine cracks and stuff and will um, suck the resin into it so uh, it, it helps make sure you get full coverage so I'm using a very soft brush and trying to get into all the little little places doesn't hurt to go a little bit overboard and then just kind of shake it out, blow it out. It's, pro it's uh, best not to have big clumps of it in there because sometimes the resin won't completely impregnate it and you'll get little patches of softer crumbly parts. But if it's just a thin layer, that's never a problem. There are a lot of different kinds of resins. The kind I'm using now is uh, Roto, Smoothcast Roto. And what that means is that it's intended for pouring into a mold and then slushing it around, as opposed to just pouring it in and it just fills up. So uh, this is also a couple years old, so keep my fingers crossed, see how well it works out. When you are mixing anything in general, always keep a bunch of paper towels on hand. You may notice I'm not overly concerned with the cleanliness of my work surface. At this point, uh, that's fine. Because of the subject matter, it's like crumbly stone. So I don't really mind if there's like weird bits and chunks and other stuff mixed in. Um, so, yeah, if you're doing something pristine, you want to make sure your, your work area is pristine. Make sure you shake them up really well. And, let's see. Mix. It's always best after you pour your measurements to um, wipe the rim. That makes it so that it's less likely to stick like that. Although at this point, um, there's probably no hope for this. I'm gonna have to use a crazy can opener to get it open anyway. Um, and I'm using So Strong tents, the same tent that I was using on the um, Plasti paste. I cannot remember the name of that for whatever reason. I'm actually using quite a bit of it. Um, it takes a lot to get 
beer resin tinted dark. Not much like if you just want it to be tinted, but if you really want it color colored, you have to use quite a bit. Ah, stir stick. That's what I need. Okay. You want to stir your color in to one part first. And then do the mixing. Resin typically has a very short pot life, a couple minutes tops. And I'm doing the normal thing where I mix it in part A and then I move it to the cup with part B, mix that back and forth, and then into a clean cup to get the final mix. Looks really dark, right? Wait till it sets up. You'll see. Oh, you'll see. Trying to hit the flattest surface and let the resin flow into the little detailed parts. I don't want to pour straight onto a detailed part because that tends to trap bubbles easier than if you're um, if it flows there naturally as opposed to getting poured, dumped on. And since I have never cast this part before, I totally just eyeballed it on how much I would need. Which is fine because I can just uh, pour more in there if I need more after this. And now I'm just going to slush it back and forth as it sets up. See, it's starting to get sludgy and it's gonna kick really fast. It's just gonna be kind of flowy one second, and then about 30 seconds later, it's gonna be not flowing at all. As you can see, I'm struggling to get it down into that corner. Yep, now let's watch the color change. It's pretty cool. Are you watching? You know, while that's setting up, I'm going to go ahead and do another one. Um, I mean, what I should do is wait, pull this one out in 10 or 15 minutes and see how it did, but I'm just kind of impatient. All right, this one currently has a spider living in it, so let's evict him. Out, spider, out. Here, you go somewhere else. Thanks. And there's still lots of little bits and crap in there. And like I said, this is supposed to be a crumbly old piece. So having that kind of stuff is not a problem at all. I think this one's pretty set. Still a, a little bit flexible, you can see. Um, and that doesn't super bother me. It might be a little distorted when it comes out, but given the organic nature of the project, I don't think anyone will ever notice. Yeah, if this was um, the final piece I wanted to make, I would definitely um, fill that in a little more so it had some more um, strength to it. All right, now let's look at this compared to the original. Okay, so first thing you'll probably notice is all of these little bubbles and holes. What's interesting is the bubbles from the mold um, got filled in by bubbles from the cast in a, in a lot of places. So that would certainly take some cleanup. You can see there's a big, a huge bubble under here. These are some huge bubbles there. 
those those were bubbles in the mold not the cast and then you can see where there's a cast bubble so the resin bubbled in the bubble of the mold eh, whatever the point is it's not perfect it'll take some cleanup time um, but I think it's it's close enough to say yeah this will this mold should certainly do the trick it's definitely not at the point where I would say, oh geez, I need to I need to make a new mold and try this again. It's like the amount of cleanup required to do two of these, or maybe one if I just want to use my original piece for one of the shoulders. Um, the amount of cleanup time is definitely less than making a new mold would be. So that's a good sign. Let's see if this piece is ready yet still radiating heat which generally means that it needs a little bit of time but for the purpose of demonstration and this test piece I don't really care all right here are some great areas to show what happens when you have too much uh, talcum powder or baby powder in there see it uh, it actually messed up these areas considerably. So, but like I said, I'm doing fast and sloppy. Don't really care about that for this test piece. Um, again, looks looks pretty solid. There's, you know, holes to fill in in places. Although a lot of places the holes work with the aesthetic just fine. So, um, doesn't seem to have the issues that this piece had which are these these big bubbles that are going to be annoying to have to carve off and then re-sculpt whatever was under them um, so yeah I'm really impressed with this brush on mold rubber I think I'm going to move to using that from now on for uh, for most things so there you go pro tip number 76 uh, brush on Mold rubber from Smooth On is awesome. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and uh, try to do some some final casts, shall we? Tch, you don't have a say in it. I'm going to do it whether you want me to or not. Yeah, these kind of really big pockets in the mold that fill up with solid lumps of resin. That's super annoying. Like, I'm putting a lot of pressure on there. That's barely coming out. That's going to require a lot of sanding and carving. So yeah, I think I'll redo the mold on this one as well. Uh, let's see, pro tip 732, keep a hold of your casts that you're not going to use for paint testing. And here's an example of one that's, that's reasonable. You can see there are one, two, three, four five out of you know there's probably a hundred little gaps in here where there could be bubbles but there's only a few and so that is a totally acceptable amount of post-production work to do on these to clean them up and there's some weird anomaly that happened here but that's on the surface it's really easy to carve that down 
So yeah, this one turned out fine. Oh, right. It's because this is the mold that had the two holes in it. So you can see, remember, I filled those in with the mother mold and that seemed to hold it in pretty well. It squeezed out a little bit there, but again, that's super easy to clean up. So um, it's pretty good relief that this mold actually turned out pretty well, despite its flaws. It's got an awful lot of little pits and bubbles, but, mm, I think it's good enough. Have quite a few of these super obnoxious mold bubbles. Oh, man, that's a lot. Yeah. I think at this point I might as well remold since I'm going to be doing other ones anyway. Now that in comparison is a very clean cast. I've got some uh, resin bubbles, which are still pretty minor, but there were, I don't see any mold bubbles that cause, causes those big gloopy blobs that I have to deal with, so yeah, that's a, that's a great mold. Yeah, I think I'm going to redo this one as well. There's an awful lot of those. And they're in difficult to clean up places too, so. Well, drat. It's alright. It's a continual learning process. Just kind of, kind of have to live with that fact. And another beautiful clean piece. Alright. Oh, that's right. He's got these ones to try out so if you'll recall this this is the um, the mold material that I got from tap plastics that I've never liked and it looks like I'm about to be proven right yet again I do not recommend this stuff every time I've used it I've been disappointed Man, that does not want to let go yeah it's just tearing apart There's got to be some, I mean, maybe the talcum powder doesn't work with this particular urethane rubber for whatever reason. But, yeah, that's just ridiculous. Not going to work. Did okay on this piece. Looks like uh, one part molds are okay for it. Oh, maybe not, we'll see. One part molds that have zero undercuts maybe. Yeah, see how that's see how that's tearing off there and sticking to the resin, and how that didn't happen with the other two urethanes that I used. Yeah, useless. All right, let's build some more molds. All right, so we're gonna mix up some more of this Rebound 25. And I have another couple products to try. We've got silicone thinner, and this stuff is surprisingly designed to thin your silicone rubber. So the reason that I got this is for the very first coat of rubber that you put on there, you want to be 
uh, bubble free, obviously. And the thinner a material is, the less likely it is to trap bubbles in general. Now, I didn't have a big problem with bubbles on the molds that I've made this stuff with. However, it can't hurt to uh, try this and just see if uh, I get even better results. It says to uh, let's see. Uh, part A needs to be mixed thoroughly of the Rebound 25. I'm going to be doing a pretty small batch because I'm going to be just hitting the, the little cracks on all of these pieces and um, I'm not going to, to do an entire coat. I just want to get a super thin layer. I'm running out of stir sticks, so I'm going to pull double duty with this one. Alright, so this stuff says don't exceed 10% by weight. So I am not about to measure this stuff out. I'm just going to eyeball it. I figure a couple drops off of this stick is probably not going to exceed 10%. So far this does not feel any thinner, but maybe that's just because when it's in a big glob like this you're not going to feel it as much. Remember to use a crappy brush because there's no coming back from this. For your brush that is. You'll probably survive the process. Your brush will not. So I think uh, when I did my last pieces I made a mistake of tacking them down to a board first and that's why I got some bubbles and the undercuts so in this case what I'm going to do this time I'm going to make sure that these undercut areas are filled and solid so I've got the just the piece loose in my hand and I don't really care about drips and that kind of stuff because um, I just know it's going to happen, so I've got stuff down under it. I'm being really jabby with the brush because I want to make sure that I'm popping any bubbles that could form in there. I'm paying special attention to this pattern because as you saw in the other mold, a little bubble formed in every single little corner. All right, now I'm going to use a little thick rubber to bulk up the uh, back sides of these. Uh,
All right, so that was the last of the Smoothcast Roto that I had. Uh, I don't have any more of that, so I'm going to use some of my old Smoothcast 300. This is a bright white uh, version, and we'll see how it does uh, with uh, roto casting. We'll probably be fine. Never actually jumped from one um, one resin to another immediately, so this is. Um, a good chance for me to see just the different properties so this smoothcast 300 is definitely runnier than the roto which makes sense because the roto is designed to cling to edges and stuff and this is designed to just fill up molds i'm actually i was going to pour the leftovers into here but it's already starting to heat up considerably meaning it's about to set so that's a bad time to start pouring into a mold because you could end up with uh, cavities that your next pour won't fill and as it's setting I see there's a difference in the way it um, this seems to slosh and string out or it doesn't slosh it strings out rather than smoothly leveling with itself like the roto does it's just not that big a deal. It just means I'll have to do a little more finishing on the inside, which I was going to have to do lots of that anyway, so not a big deal. It's always a good idea to go through your reference from time to time as you're working, especially on a multi-year project like this one has become. And one thing I noticed uh, when playing through it is that this guy has a very distinct hump, which is very, very bovine, very bull-like. Makes sense since he's kind of based on a minotaur. Um, so I'm going to build up some mass here to give him that profile that I'm wanting to get. And now, as we discussed recently, this stuff kind of has an oily uh, residue to it. Um, even when I super mix it, like they say, I'm still not consistently getting a non, you know, I'm not getting it to the point where I'm comfortable having that be the surface. However, if I'm just building up mass, this is a lot better uh, medium because it comes in these giant buckets, right? And therefore, just the price per ounce or whatever 
it's going to be quite a bit less. So I'm going to build up the mass with this and then whatever I use to skin it with, uh, we'll go over that. Here we go. I'm actually going to leave this uh, little crest nub here. You know, I made these, these six new ones. So they're going to go over that. And I'm just going to leave that there as the general height that I want to achieve. And it works well as an anchor for the massing foil that I'm putting in. I'm going to want to protect this uh, seam on the head. We might have to carry this, this bulking over onto the head a little bit. That would be annoying, but that's the price you pay for perfectionism.